Good afternoon. I'm Cami Abernathy, Dean of the Herbert Wertheim College of Engineering. Thank you for joining us today as we have an exciting presentation planned for you. We're thrilled to have Dr. Wally Rines here with us today to discuss the evolution of collection, analysis, and protection of big data. Today, you'll learn more about how AI and machine learning drive the analysis of data and how fully homomorphic encryption will drive its ultimate protection in the future. Dr. Rines is president and CEO of Kronami Inc., a fabulous software semiconductor company focused on intelligent computing for fully homomorphic encryption and machine learning. He was previously CEO of Mentor Graphics for 25 years and chairman of the board for 17 years. During his tenure at Mentor, revenue nearly quadrupled and market value of the company increased tenfold. Prior to joining Mentor Graphics, Dr. Rines was executive vice president, Semiconductor Group, responsible for TI's worldwide semiconductor business. During his 21 years at TI, he was president of the Data Systems Group, held numerous semiconductor executive management positions, and was directly responsible for the creation and growth of the digital signal processing business, which eventually comprised about 50% of TI's total revenue. Dr. Rines has served on the boards of Cirrus Logic, Corvo, TriQuint Semiconductor, Global Logic, PTK Corp, and as chairman of the Electronic Design Automation Consortium, five two-year terms. He is also a board member of the Semiconductor Research Corporation and First Growth Children and Family Charities. He's a lifetime fellow of the IEEE and has served on the board of trustees of Lewis and Clark College, the National Advisory Board of the University of Michigan, and the Industrial Committees advising Stanford University and the University of Florida. Dr. Rines holds a bachelor's of science degree in engineering from the University of Michigan, a master of science and PhD in material science and engineering from Stanford University, a master's of business administration from Southern Methodist University, and honorary doctor of technology degrees from the University of Florida and Nottingham Trent University. We're very happy that Dr. Rines is a Gator. Dr. Rines has been very gracious to share his wisdom and expertise with us over the years. I was so impressed with his deep and visionary understanding of the role that AI will play in the future that I asked him to serve as our first speaker in our new webinar series on the future of AI. With that, I will hand it off to Wally to begin. Thanks Thank very much, all. Kenny. <laughs> My pleasure. Uh, let me uh, click the slides up here, uh, if I can get them. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I want to talk today about big data because it's one of the overarching driving forces for artificial intelligence. The people uh, sometimes comment to me that this uh, AI thing just has come out of nowhere. In the last five years, it's become such a big thing. You know, how did that all happen so quickly? And I have to point out, you know, it hasn't been quickly. It's been actually over a, a long period of time. Uh, this is the cover of High Technology Magazine in July of 1986, about 35 years ago. And uh, what you see there in the headline is artificial intelligence, heavyweights get into the act. I'm sure you recognize that that's me on the left side uh, there in the photo. I think I still look like that. And uh, on the right, that's George Halmeyer, who was uh, head of DARPA and then later uh, head of R&D at TI. And uh, because I was president of the data systems group, uh, George pushed hard uh, to get us all to make artificial intelligence a reality. But you know, it just didn't happen. It didn't happen for a variety of reasons. Back uh, in the 1980s, we had a lack of big data to analyze. We didn't have the internet of things and, and we had limited computing power as well and a need for more advanced algorithms. And most of all, we had a lack of killer applications to make money. So we developed uh, expert systems and we developed hardware. And I found recently at one of our uh, University of Florida uh, advisory committee meetings that we did an expert system for Campbell's Soup that they uh, still remember, but it didn't generate much business. Today, things are different. All of those limitations have gone away and now we're entering a new era. And that era, I believe is driven by more than just artificial intelligence as a tool. It's driven by what happens to data and what many have referred to as a transition that uh, over the next hundred years data will become the new oil. It represents the wealth of society. All of our know-how, our innovation, all the things are encapsulated in our data. 
And we see today uh, companies like Google and Facebook make enormous amounts of money with databases and using those databases and selling access uh, through uh, their services. Uh, but data has not spread to the point where it's so universal as energy is. And I believe that will happen, but a number of things have to happen to make it real. Uh, you just think about uh, aircraft engine manufacturers, for example, Pratt & Whitney or General Electric, Rolls-Royce, people like that who build aircraft uh, engines. And those engines are used by many different airlines, uh, by many different aircraft manufacturers, and then the planes are purchased by many different airlines. A airline that buys a plane also buys a service for monitoring of the engines on that plane. For example, a single twin engine aircraft that does a 12 hour flight will produce over 800 terabytes of data. And the engine manufacturer monitors that data, looks for signs that there could be an emerging problem, looks for when maintenance should be done. And they have the data from every similar engine on every plane, regardless of the airline. So they have a monopoly. So they could give away the engine for free because the airlines have to buy the service to do that monitoring to fly the plane safely. Well, information is the leverage point there and it's becoming so in many other businesses. Today, I'd like to look at what it takes to make data the new oil, the store of wealth for society. And I'm gonna talk about three areas. One is the collection, another the analysis, and lastly, the protection of data. Let's start with the collection. Now, today, uh, a lot of people tell us we're collecting far more data than we can analyze. There have been studies that say we actually only analyze about 2% of the data that is made available to computers today. And the total amount of data available on computers doubles about every two years. That is the total base we had two years ago will now be twice as great two years later. And as we uh, collect all that data, there are a variety of new sources. One of them of course is video. Video just for surveillance where surveillance cameras are increasing in number almost 50% per year, running 24 hours a day, recording petabytes of data that's all stored and then has to be analyzed. But it's much more than surveillance. It's every kind of uh, graphical storage, uh, video storage for applications from medical to automotive to a whole variety of things, as well as billions of cell phones taking videos and recording all that data. If you think that produces a lot of video, consider the problem at the Stanford Linear Accelerator, where they have an X-ray camera that has to photograph 100,000 frames per second in order to capture the specific events they're looking for in the accelerator. And they have to look at those 100,000 frames and see if one of the frames contains useful information. Believe it or not, there is technology coming along that will solve that problem uh, within the next year, but there'll be an even bigger problem at CERN with their accelerator where they uh, have 600 million events per second and 600 terabytes per second of data. So there's no limit to the amount of data we have to analyze and video is just the start. Collecting that data has become a real challenge. So we have sensors all over the world, sensing everything from your Fitbit or iWatch with all your health data, through all of the weather sensors, moisture sensors, uh, humidity, millions of different sensors that have to collect that data. And for the electronics industry, design of those sensors is a real challenge. Because there are going to be millions of them, they have to be very cheap. They have to be very low power, but even more challenging they involve multiple disparate technologies. The sensor frequently analog, something like MEMS for micromechanical uh, sensors has to interface uh, with analog circuitry and sometimes analog signal processing and then uh, digital circuits uh, to do pre-processing and typically a microcontroller or something. Uh, and then of course, 
the information has to be communicated through a serial link or through RF communications. And this is the kind of design challenge that's a real headache for electronic designers because you're looking at totally different technologies and most of design today is done all in one domain, uh, uh, mostly digital or digital with some analog interface. So lots of challenges to build those sensors. And you would think the semiconductor industry must be making a mint doing this. Actually, the internet of things has been very disappointing for the semiconductor industry. Yes, they build a lot of sensors, but they don't make much money on them. Who does make money? <laughs> the people who capture the data, who analyze it, who resell it or use it. So the sensors and the semiconductor industries at the bottom of the food chain and the people at the top of the food chain are the Googles and Facebooks and others who collect all that information. And that becomes so valuable that these people at the top of the food chain are finding more and more, they don't want to share that information with others. I was at a uh, the design automation conference about five years ago and some Google engineers gave a presentation on a chip they had developed that had RF communications and would communicate to an insulin pump that people wore on their belts, people who had diabetes. Now, diabetes is a really a terrible disease, affects almost 400 million people worldwide. And what they were able to do is to sense in the liquid in your eye, the balance between insulin and glycogen in your body and adjust the pump to keep them in balance and effectively negate all the negative aspects of diabetes. And as I listened to the presentation, a person next to me said, my gosh, Google is getting in the semiconductor business. They're gonna be selling those chips. I thought about it and said, no, you know, Google does not want to get in the semiconductor business. It's a terrible business. They're in the information business. They want to capture the data. They want to get between you and your doctor. They want to provide the information processing. And that's what the AI of data management is all about. And it's not just Google. It's Facebook, Amazon, Alibaba, all of these systems and information companies have now gotten into the game of designing their own chips, their own systems, their own electronic modules to collect that data, to analyze the data, and to provide the infrastructure that lets them capture the data that has value. And it's more than just IT companies, it, it's automotive companies and tier one automotive and others who have now gotten in the business of designing their own chips and are actively participating in the electronics business. And this is one reason why the electronic design automation business is doing so well right now. Well, companies like Tesla, rather than buy a standard processor, designed their own machine learning processor, or a very good one, I might add, a very high performance so that a Tesla car can learn from the experience of driving. And consumer products companies like LG, not using standard products, they design their own AI chips to provide optimized data and data analysis. Well, if we look at the totals and say, who is buying those silicon wafers that are produced by silicon foundries around the world? 10 years ago, the answer was simple, either fabulous semiconductor companies shown in green on this chart, or IDMs, integrated device manufacturers, the TI, Samsung, Intel, people like that. That's about it. But over the last 10 years, it shifted dramatically. And now almost 20% of those wafers are purchased by systems companies. Apple purchases a lot, but it's a lot more than that. It's the Googles and Facebooks and automotive companies. Suddenly, silicon has become available to systems companies who want to use it for very specific purposes. Let's talk about the analysis part of making data the new oil. You know, one of the things about artificial intelligence is the things that humans do are require a very different kind of com compute capability compared to what digital computers have done for the last 75 years. Our computers are largely von Neumann architectures with instructions and data executed sequentially where things like image processing and vision and other things, that doesn't work very well. It takes billions of cycles to do what your brain is able to do in very few cycles. 
And so what the semiconductor industry and the computer industry have had to do is to look at the human brain and try to develop architectures that can do many of the same things. Now, in your brain, you have uh, axons and neurons connecting together in synapses, and those synapses learn and store all the information from the time you're a baby, and they put weightings on the synapses. And so today, we've developed computer chips that build in neural networks. And the, your brain is not only very fast at certain kinds of computation, like vision and vision processing and other senses, but it's also extremely power efficient. Uh, by some metrics, nine orders of magnitude more efficient than the best computers of today. So we're able to do all sorts of computation in our brains that digital computers just can't do. So the chips that are coming to market today are special purpose. You see some of them, they're at the University of Florida from the leader, NVIDIA. Uh, and if you went into their chips, you'd find that they have neural networks that are getting bigger and bigger. And these neural networks have nodes that can have weighting coefficients. And the more layers we put in a neural network, the deeper the machine learning until we can get to the kinds of densities you see in the human brain. Well, all sorts of companies have jumped into the act. This is a chart of venture capital funding in fabulous semiconductor companies. If we go back to the year 2000, a big boom year, the venture capital community invested two and a half billion dollars in the year 2000 in fabulous semiconductor startups. And then we started the great decline. Each, uh, every few years, less and less was invested until by 2016, it was less than half a billion dollars per year in fabulous semiconductor companies. And then a remarkable thing happened in 2017, that number tripled. And then in 2018, a new record, three and a half billion, a billion dollars greater than the previous record in the year 2000. And since that time, the numbers have been holding up at about $2 billion per year. What's causing that? Well, you can see artificial intelligence is the biggest single driver. The share of venture capital is shown in green on those charts, and that is powering all sorts of fabulous semiconductor companies. Well, if I just look at a seven-year period from 2012 and look at the first three rounds of funding, from venture capitalists, you can see that by far the largest share, $2.7 billion, is targeted at companies that say they are doing artificial intelligence or machine learning or both. It's been the driving force. And you have to ask, well, what are the applications that they are targeting for their companies? Uh, this shows the number of companies in each of a wide variety of applications for uh, deep learning or artificial intelligence. By far, the biggest set are the ones I show uh, shown in blue that I would categorize as pattern recognition. The largest number, 45 of them, are targeted at vision or facial recognition, but pattern recognition is much more than that. It's voice recognition. It's smell recognition, sound recognition. It's uh, disease diagnosis, reading MRIs and x-rays. It's all types of visual processing and it's created enormous wealth and success for many of these companies. Take for example, SenseTime. SenseTime in China raised $1.6 billion of venture capital just for facial recognition and they have a market cap well in excess of four and a half billion dollars today. And they are only one of many. Face++ does essentially the same thing and raised over $600 million in funding. Well, the second biggest category is the data centers and high performance computing. Special purpose processors to do processing of data relevant to machine learning. That's a good example here at the University of Florida where NVIDIA, the leader, does dedicated processors. Bill Daly, one of their chief architects, uh, speaks at conferences about the next generation architecture and the latest Ampere processor, which goes into the University of Florida Center that uh, 
uh, NVIDIA, Jensen Wong and Chris Malakowski generously donated is making the University of Florida a key center for the processing of data, the analysis through artificial intelligence. Well, the last category, 36 companies, is for generic edge computing. The thing I said was actually not that exciting for the semiconductor industry because most of the big data processing is done in the cloud, in the data center, and the amount of edge computing has been slow to take off, but it's going to take off. It's going to be very, very big. How do I know that? <laughs> because it always happens that way. You get a capability in the cloud or in a central processor. Think back to the 1960s where mainframe computers did all the computing and dumb terminals talked to them. Step ahead 20 years and we have a hierarchy that includes mini computers and other pre-processing between us, the dumb terminals and the mainframe computers. Another 20 years and we have personal computers with peripherals that uh, make up the hierarchy and more and more of the intelligent processing is done locally. And so the intelligence is flowing downhill so that today we have cloud computing, we have gateways in what might be referred to as the fog to aggregate uh, data. So not every transaction has to go to the cloud. And then we have edge nodes in the mist where we do all sorts of intelligent processing. And that movement of intelligence moves downward as the capability of individual chips increases. And it does at a very rapid rate. So we know that edge computing will increasingly be where we do the machine learning, although we will always have the central cloud to do the heavy duty processing. Let me turn uh, lastly to the issue of protection of data. After all, if data is the new oil, you don't want people to be able to steal it, but data is very tough to protect, probably more difficult than oil. Uh, Eric Chen at uh, uh, SoftBank has uh, uh, given a variety of presentations on what he calls privacy computing. And what that targets is sharing the value of data in untrusted environments. He highlights three basic approaches. One, the approach that's really used by Google and Facebook and others today is they bring the data to the algorithm and they have closed data centers that they control and they trust their execution environment. But that actually uh, for them and even for you when you send your data to the cloud, you're trusting a lot of people. You're trusting it won't be hacked into in the data center. You're trusting the chips, the operating system. You're trusting Intel, ARM, Dell, all those people with your private data, pretty risky. So another form is uh, what Google calls federated learning, where they build their machine learning model in the cloud, and then you don't send your data to them, they send their model to you, and it sits in your compute environment and learns from your data, and then you send back the improved model to the center. Well. That's okay, but you're trusting that their model is not stealing your data. You're trusting it in your data center. So uh, there's a lot of risk there. There's actually only one way known today where you can trust no one, and that's homomorphic encryption. And the reason you can trust no one is that the, the data always stays encrypted and encrypted in a form that no one has ever been able to hack and probably won't be able to certainly for a long, long time. So what is homomorphic encryption? Well, homomorphic encryption allows us to do what the Department of Defense calls securing the data, not the data center. And DOD has a zero trust uh, strategy, a zero trust strategy, which says they trust no one. They don't trust the chips, they don't trust the operating system, they don't trust the data center. So they want the data to always stay encrypted. So you as the client, take your data and keep it encrypted. And only you are able to uh, have a key and can unencrypt it. You send it to the cloud in encrypted form. And there in the cloud, all forms of computation can be done on that data without ever decrypting it. Now today, anything you send to the cloud for compute, they have to decrypt it in order to process it. But with homomorphic encryption, that's not necessary. 
it's done in encrypted form and it's sent back still encrypted so that the client can decrypt it. Sounds like magic, doesn't it? Well, it is, but it's something that has evolved in very recent years so that DARPA refers to it as the holy grail of computer security. They talk about Google taking confidential medical data and uh, can that go on and, and will people be willing to give that data? But if that data could all be encrypted, if no one could ever see it, then you could build amazing machine learning models. And in fact, that's exactly what's going to happen. Uh, now, if you wanna build a machine learning model, you have security issues associated with training data, which you wanna keep private. You don't want other people to get your training data for your model. After all, the model is proprietary. And input privacy, people are not going to give you medical data, financial data, Department of Defense secure data, uh, unless it's in encrypted form. You have to be able to use it in encrypted form. And the output privacy, you want to be able to send the output still encrypted to whoever is going to benefit from using your model. And then the model needs to say private. If we're going to capture the value of data, then we be, need to be able to sell it again and again without worrying that people will steal the data. Well, an example, GPT-3, many of you have heard of it, uh, uh, an amazing machine learning model, uh, 175 billion parameter neural network. It can output text that you can't distinguish from uh, human text. But the problem is there's an enormous investment in training that 175 billion parameters, $4.6 million per instance. And you have to do that very often. So you certainly, don't want someone to be able to steal it, you'd like to keep the model encrypted. And with homomorphic encryption, you can leave it encrypted and you can still get all of the benefits. So with machine learning using encrypted data, it makes it possible to use the encrypted data to build the model. And then the owners of the sensitive data can use the encryption of their data to ensure that no one will ever see the raw data. And the machine learning model can be built using encrypted data to create an encrypted model. So encrypted queries can be made and encrypted results can be sent back. IDC estimates that the machine learning market for software and services will reach $20 billion over the next five years. Well, there is one minor problem. You would think with all these advantages, why, why aren't people using this more today? And the answer is shown here in yellow. Uh, it's fairly performance intensive. In fact, to do those operations on encrypted data requires performance about a million times the best uh, Intel Xeon processor with uh, 96 embedded cores. That's a tall order. You can't just clock, uh, crank up the clock speed by a million times. So you have to be more clever. Now, the reason is that fully homomorphic encryption is computationally a very difficult problem. If you look at the upper right at that boots and function, you, you're doing circuit-like uh, operations, an and operation, but those inputs A and B, which would normally be single bits, one or zero, in homomorphic encryption, they are uh, they are transformed into 500 order polynomials with double precision floating point coefficients. So uh, when you do calculations on the data, uh, it requires 3,064 bit floating point fast Fourier transforms. And in a typical calculation, as we sh show in the main chart, about 500 loops, each loop requiring 3,000 fast Fourier transforms. That's an enormous amount of compute to do what you used to do just with ones and zeros. So how do you go about doing that? Well, one of the leading uh, FinTech companies uh, in the United States is absolutely dedicated to converting to fully homomorphic encryption. And so they've been trying to do it on traditional processors. And they uh, ran a benchmark with 100 million 
data entries and they did uh, a whole variety of calculations, min, max, and sorting, and uh, other arithmetic computation. And they did it uh, on the Amazon Web Services and they, they powered up 24,000 Intel cores. And it ran on this benchmark of the 100 million entries, took 4.4 days. Just not gonna hack it. Their goal is 10 minutes. Once it gets to 10 minutes, they will convert all of their servers to fully homomorphic encryption. Well, it turns out that innovative people around the world have found ways to do multi-core processing because fully homomorphic encryption lends itself well to parallelism and data movement. And so with uh, chip architectures that have already been designed and simulated and emulated, the, uh, the problem that this company had can be taken down from 4.4 days to 10 seconds. They don't even need that. Uh, rather than using 12 and a half racks, they'll just use one and a half racks and do it in 10 minutes and they'll be set. Well, the problem of course is parallel computing has been a challenge for the computer industry for a long time. Uh, this is actual data from emulation of a chip design uh, where compilers have been used to uh, encode the, uh, the data in uh, independently executable streams of in, in control and data. And uh, the vertical axis is the throughput and the horizontal axis is the number of cores. Down there in red, you see the Intel i9. After you get beyond about four cores, you get less performance rather than more by utilizing additional cores because of memory bottlenecks and other reasons. But uh, in a compiled parallel computing environment, you get linear performance. Uh, in this case, it's been verified up to a million cores or a million X speed up about 3 million cores. So what do you need to make FHE every day? Massive parallelism at today's clock rates, Minimize memory reads and writes. Uh, if you listen to Bill Daly's presentations from NVIDIA, he'll tell you that over 90% of the power dissipation in an NVIDIA AI processor is consumed writing and reading from memory. Uh, fortunately, FHE keeps data in motion. It doesn't write it and read it uh, very often. Now you also need software that can generate the independent executable code, very advanced compilers, and you need chip hardware that can scale linearly with a number of processor cores across multiple chips, multiple boards, and multiple servers. Well, that actually is uh, very close to existence. And uh, within the next year, those kinds of servers will be available. And it's really just in time because cloud security is a very critical issue. By some estimates, uh, the cost of regulatory compliance and data breaches is in the trillions of dollars uh, in the coming year and will only become greater. There is certainly increased attention to data integrity. In the US election process, for example, Microsoft uh, had a product called Election Guard that used homomorphic encryption in the elections because they, they could do it on traditional computers because all they really had to do was add and subtract and compare and check data. Uh, but that will become more broadly used and Microsoft is a real driver in the industry. The Department of Defense has taken a firm position that they will move to fully homomorphic encryption. And Gartner estimates that 25% of all companies will have homomorphic encryption programs over the next five years. As I said, machine learning is a big business and there are all sorts of software and service companies emerging who will help companies adopt homomorphic encryption. There's something else, the sword of Damocles, the sense of impending disaster. Well, we have an impending disaster. The fact is that the security used on the internet today can be broken by uh, quantum computers. Now, fully homomorphic encryption is one of the few that is referred to as quantum proof and can't be broken. But for the security we use today, the estimate is that once you get to about a thousand qubits in a quantum computer, you will be able to break most of the security on the internet. IBM estimates that they'll be at a thousand qubits by 2023. So homomorphic encryption is not coming any too soon.
And that's why you see so many headlines and articles about homomorphic encryption and when will it take over and who can use it and when will it become really practical. So data is the new oil, a tremendous opportunity. It's where artificial intelligence will have among its greatest impact. We've come a long way in terms of the collection, the analysis, the protection. We have a little bit more to go, but this is going to change the world. We're going to be able to have individual people take their valuable data, to aggregate data from others, to use it, to build intelligent models that can be used without ever revealing the actual data and can be used to improve our lives and discover all sorts of dependencies in nature that create new opportunities and make our lives much richer. So thank you. Thank you, Wally, for that fascinating presentation. Wally's very graciously agreed to answer some questions from our audience, so please put your questions in the Q&A or chat boxes. We've already got a few questions that have already come in, Wally. So one of the questions, you touched on the voting issue. Could you expand a little bit more on um, how homomorphic encryption can secure voting uh, and voting registration databases? Yes, so uh, the specific motivation that Microsoft had when they developed Election Guard was the fear of foreign interference, the ability to hack into computers, voting machines, and other things. And of course, the ultimate way to protect that is if the data is uh, uh, encrypted and all processing on the data is done uh, in encrypted form, then there's no one, no way anyone can get in and alter that data, alter the votes. And so they had uh, uh, not enormous acceptance, but dozens of uh, election sites did choose to in fact use the Microsoft system. And they used conventional computers for it because the computation was not particularly difficult. They just had to be sure that the votes were added up correctly. So when you see partially homomorphic encryption or just homomorphic encryption, you're talking about a subset of computation, typically addition and subtraction. When you talk about fully homomorphic encryption, you're talking about any type of computation. That's where the real challenge lies. That's where the invention by Craig Gentry uh, in his PhD thesis in 2009 at Stanford uh, opened the eyes of the world and has caused a, a major move of uh, advanced mathematicians and computer science uh, uh, experts to see how can we implement it, how can we use it more effectively, and elections are but one of the many possible applications. So one uh, listener asks about blockchain. Is blockchain another way to provide security, or is homomorphic encryption a better approach? Blockchain is, and for certain kinds of applications, blockchain appears to have a high degree of security, although uh, there are hacking cases that we've uh, heard about. Uh, but certainly it's an alternative. The problem is it's not general purpose for the kinds of computing in an average data center that you would want to protect the data for your clients or your own data. Uh, homomorphic encryption is generic. It means all of the data is encrypted at all times and uh, no one ever gets access to it. Next question is a little bit more technical. Could you comment on the role of sparsity on the efficiency of neural networks? After um, all, the brain is a sparse network. Yeah, uh, actually, if you listen to the talks by all these people developing chips, they will point out uh, how they take advantage of sparsity in terms of dramatic performance improvement. And that is in fact uh, a key element in the architectures for these chips. Uh, sparse networks, of course, uh, uh, for any of you not in this business, uh, involve lots of zeros in matrices where you're doing computation you don't really need to do, but it takes intelligence to figure out where you don't need to do it. Uh, but uh, at any rate, there is a role, an important role for sparsity and the computer architects love to find opportunities to take advantage of it. The Million homomorphic encryption problem assumes that the computation encryption is digital. How about all analog neuromorphic neural networks? Yeah, uh, 
That's a problem. Uh, so <laughs> I guess I would have to say that we need a lot of A to D converters and, <laughs> uh, and uh, get that analog data in digital form because the algorithm for FHE does operate on digital data. We have to have ones and zeros. Uh, so uh, other techniques uh, would have to be used to protect your analog data. The schemes that Tesla and Google are proposing, do you think those will become commonplace? Will we be using those types of, of schemes? I do. Uh, one of the great things about machine learning is that if you want to do a superior processor for a narrower domain of uh, requirements, you can almost always uh, outperform the general purpose processors. And so uh, in Google's case, they had a very, I'm sorry, in uh, Tesla's case, they had a very a specific set of uh, computation types that they wanted to do. And they were able to design a chip that did it uh, very effectively, more so than the generic chips on the market. And uh, they're just looking at one particular case. Uh, I think, uh, as, as I showed, you know, there are dozens of uh, neural network processors or AI machine learning processors, and they all emphasize uh, different things. And so uh, it turns out that uh, for machine learning, uh, there are reasons to support many different architectures, although I, I would say NVIDIA certainly is the champion for the broad-based set of machine learning processors. Uh, but for uh, fully homomorphic encryption, no one that I know of, uh, well, other than <laughs> Kornami, has claimed to be able to do it. Uh, because it's a little different kind of problem than machine learning. It's, it's one where you have to take advantage of the fact that data remains in motion in a systolic array and doesn't uh, have to be uh, read or rewritten. And so it's a, di a different category that requires a different kind of architecture. There's actually two parts to the next question. This is more of a philosophical question. If data is like oil, uh, Will we be fighting wars over data in the future like we've fought wars over oil in the past? Yeah, I think we are already uh, at least being threatened by it. I, I have a, a friend at Taiwan Semiconductor who says he can tell me when they get up in the morning in Beijing because that's when the bombardment of hacks uh, go to TSMC to try to steal their manufacturing process data. Uh, we're being uh, hacked continually uh, uh, hospitals are shut down, banks are uh, uh, being attacked. Uh, so uh, I would say, uh, yes, just like oil, people will go to war over data in the same way they'll go to war over uh, uh, oil. And so what we need to do is have effective ways to protect our data. Now, DARPA has taken the position, at least thus far, that fully homomorphic encryption ought to be available to everyone. Uh, so that uh, DOD can run their most secure uh, uh, problems on computers anywhere in the world. But it remains to be seen whether that will become federal policy or whether the U.S. will try to uh, uh, be one of the, be able to protect its own data without uh, protecting computers elsewhere in the world. That does raise an interesting uh, point, Wally. There's been a lot of talk about democratization of data and empowering people to own their own data and be able to monetize it. Would fully homomorphic encryption be a step toward that, allowing people to control access to their own personal data? It is the absolute enabler. In fact, as far as I know, it's the only way that you can protect your data from anyone else stealing it. So today, you think about most of the intellectual exercises where you build up a database, the plain text goes to other people. If someone wants to copy your article, they want to copy your computer program, whatever, it is very exposed. Once you can encrypt it with a type of encryption that cannot be broken even by quantum computers, then all of a sudden you now have your data protected. And the great thing about homomorphic encryption is you can sell the use of your data without ever releasing your data. The plain text is never seen only the encrypted form, and you can run all the computations. So we could collect medical data from millions of people who are sensitive about their medical data, but are willing to give it up as long as no one ever sees the actual data, 
and we can build a machine learning model that's predictive of diseases or other uh, analyses. And uh, those models can be used and they can be charged for uh, people. Uh, people who build up superior models can charge a higher price than those uh, who don't and they can sell them again and again. And so unlike the oil that is burned, this can be reused again and again. So oil is the new, re or data is the new recyclable oil, I guess. Recyc is the yes, that's right, it's the green oil. <laughs> So the next question is about power consumption, all the power that's, that's required to collect, analyze, and protect data. Googleplex, for example, now consumes a lot of power. Will AI be one of the major power consumers in the future? Well, it already is a, a big consumer. I guess you probably realize at the University of Florida, the power bills you're going to get from your center. Uh, yeah, they... Uh, uh, I used to live in Oregon, and of course, uh, Google had centers uh, along the Columbia River uh, uh, just because they could have their own pu uh, public utility district and they had uh, a source of hydroelectric power. Uh, hundreds of millions of dollars per year to run a typical big server center, and now we're spawning those server centers at a rapid rate and will uh, continue to do so. And so uh, it's important that we become more power efficient. That's why, as I mentioned, if you want to get a million times the performance of today's servers, you're not going to do it by running them faster. You're going to do it by intelligent uh, vectorization of the applications to run them on parallel processors so that you don't have to run them faster. Power is CV squared F. And so we've got the F is frequency. And if you run it up by a factor of a million, you're going to burn a lot more power. So we have to, in fact, design systems that can run at the same clock rates and the same or lower voltages if we're going to keep the power under control. So this brings up a sort of a corollary then. Won't in some way AI drive us even more in the direction of developing clean energy because of the power requirements? Uh, well, certainly the AI teaches us a lot of efficiencies that we can achieve to use less power. It also uh, helps us with intelligent ways to use the power that we have. And uh, you look at something like controlling the grid, uh, the, uh, the kinds of analysis you have to do so that the right amount of power is available at the right time in the right place uh, will take great advantage of artificial intelligence algorithms to do that kind of computation in addition to all the other applications that AI provides. I was surprised a few years ago to find that one of the most aggressive companies in the state of Florida in the pursuit of AI was Florida Power and Light for very similar reasons to what you just suggested. Here's another okay. philosophical sort of question. Have you followed the recent decryption of pig's brain activity demonstrated by Neuralink, Elon Musk's company? Do you have any comments on the perspective of actually reading minds? I apologize. I have not followed that. It doesn't surprise me that Elon Musk would be doing it <laughs> because anything far out, uh, uh, Elon is clearly interested in. Uh, so I will follow up and, uh, and see what I can do to educate myself in pig's brain uh, analysis. I think it really does underscore, though, this concern about AI taking over control of our lives of our privacy of our information i think that's why your comments about fhe are so important because there's a real concern that ai will subsume all of our data into the yeah, control I of others uh, fully homomorphic encryption solves a great deal of the problem that google and facebook and others face in fact uh, there's some question as to whether they can possibly comply with the european data regulations uh, uh, but if all data stayed encrypted, they, then they could be totally in compliance. It's just that they would have to upgrade their computers to be able to compute uh, using encrypted data rather than plain text. This is an interesting observation. If wealth and investment are absorbed by data, how do we maintain investment in other needed commodities like digital hardware? Uh, how do we maintain the investment? Uh, how do we continue to invest in advancements in other technologies? Uh, I, I think the, the money will become available if the applications indicate that the value is there. 
And uh, so we've seen this big spurt of venture capital. All of a sudden, uh, you know, after getting down to half a billion a year, it jumps to three and a half billion a year. These people are not in the business for charity. You know, they are investing because they believe that the improved performance of these architectures will allow uh, things that couldn't be done before or greater efficiency in the things that can be done. And people will pay for that. They'll pay for it because it brings them wealth, just as I'm sure uh, Florida Power and Light is uh, using AI algorithms because they believe it will make them more profitable and cost them less. And I think that's how the, the funding will go. But I would have to say that uh, your early identification of hardware security as a key thrust for the University of Florida was quite insightful and bringing people like Mark Taranapur in has really made uh, Florida a very uh, key uh, recognized uh, a university in what is emerging as one of the most important areas of computing and artificial intelligence. Well, we're very fortunate that we have really outstanding advisors like yourself who tell us that cybersecurity is going to be a very important issue and then we go out and follow up and find the right people courtesy of your introduction. So um, you've always given us great advice, Wally. Uh, we really oh, appreciate thanks. it. So let's see, the next question is about um, data pre-processing. There's generally, according to this questioner, a long process of cleaning up the data before any model training. Is that still possible with FHE? Uh, so that is a pre-processing stage. Uh, usually, uh, that's a case where whoever owns the data uh, will have access to plain text data to do that. Uh, you could encrypt it and sort it, but I don't know uh, the cleanup process uh, uh, frequently involves things that are not computationally predictive. I'm actually an advisor on an AI company board where they a great deal of what they do is the cleanup to get the data in a form that they can then use it uh, in algorithms. And uh, so it's a, a problem uh, at least my group working on fully homomorphic encryption hasn't taken on yet. We're right now taking advantage of the fact that uh, for machine learning, there are standard interfaces, Onyx, PyTorch, TensorFlow, and people write applications to that standard interface. So we can, those interfaces are simply like instruction sets and we can accelerate those instructions six orders of magnitude and therefore the actual machine learning application executes uh, in uh, uh, homomorphic in encrypted form at the same speed as it would in plain text. When you get to the more general purpose computer operations, uh, there are more challenges and that requires the compilers to take the, uh, the source code and uh, vectorize it in essence. And uh, uh, that's a bigger task. Uh, there are uh, what we refer to as the uh, the tyranny of non-deterministic threads. That is, uh, all the source code today is messed up with all sorts of synchronization processes to allow parallel computing and deep pipelines to work. And I think ultimately a great deal of that software is going to have to be modified so that those synchronization functions and those non-deterministic threads are removed and things are programmed in a form where they can stream the threads and uh, not have uh, all of the complexity that has come into uh, uh, computing sort of step by step in recent years. One of the uh, issues that's been raised over the last several years with regards to AI is how do you govern it? How do you regulate it? And the next question says, are you aware of any laws or pointers to court cases for data protection or data privacy even related to AI, but broadly personal consumer data? Well, the European GPRS uh, restrictions are awesome uh, in terms of data protection, uh, uh, questionable who can really comply with them. Uh, and of course, the, uh, the US Congress is uh, rapidly uh, uh, looking for ways to regulate uh, elements of privacy. Once again, uh, if you take a step to go to homomorphic encryption, uh, much of the problem is solved, but I don't expect that to happen overnight. Uh, so I suspect regulations will be put in place that put uh, penalties uh, in place that will motivate companies 
to adopt something like uh, homomorphic encryption, whereas they might otherwise say, hey, this is an unnecessary expense. And so to that extent, the regulation can have a good effect. Normally, being a technologist, I view regulation as the enemy of innovation. And so I, uh, I don't generally support it. Will probably be our last question while in the interest of time. Do you think processor architectures with local RAM or MRAM address some of the processing efficiency issues? They do. And so most of the architectures you see for those AI processors that are being funded today have some type of local memory. And you mentioned MRAM, a good example of one that's been around a long time, but uh, allows you to go to lower power and have non-volatility. Uh, there are a whole variety, phase change memories, for example. I think there's a fundamental problem with all of them in that they consume energy. A phase change memory, you know a phase change, no matter how minor and how few atoms, it still takes energy. And so the magnetoresistive approaches, others that uh, use less energy, uh, have the advantage of lower power, but typically not the non-volatility. There are some under investigation now. Uh, there's a program at DARPA, I talked to them last week on, where they may be able to get the best of both worlds. But I think it's, uh, it's emerging slowly, but uh, we're seeing ferroelectric memories and uh, uh, FRAM, MRAM, uh, all these uh, being played with. And uh, since memory is so uh, thirty-five percent of the total cost of of components for servers, I expect the innovation will continue, and we'll see more of these. But non-volatility and low power are the two big challenges. One last question came in. I'm going to make this the last question. I promise. How are keys protected, or will keys become subject to key napping? Yeah. Now there. I don't have a solution. Uh, people also ask me, well, what about the rogue employee who uh, gets at your, your data? There are some elements of security that are tough to overcome. Uh, one way you could do it, of course, is you limit the accessibility of your key and you do it like the nuclear codes. You have multiple people have to participate in the decryption, but that's, that's a lot of burden uh, if you're dealing with all of your data in encrypted form. Uh, ultimately, you need to get at the plain text at some point. And so uh, those are problems, and, and there's some others like it. Uh, security of messaging. You know, how do you know a message came from the, the source that it claims to be? Uh, homomorphic encryption doesn't solve that problem, and there are other problems like that. So while, while it's great for protecting data, uh, it doesn't, there are many, many other problems that we can work on. So I don't think your, uh, your departments will be without challenges for the next PhD thesis. I think in the interest of time, we're gonna to have to stop there, Wally. That was really fascinating. I don't know if you've been watching some of the comments coming through on the chat and Q&A, but the feedback's been phenomenal. A lot of uh, very positive comments. I think you took a very complex subject and made it understandable for a lot of people. So I just wanna thank you again for sharing your insights with us today. I think the rest of you can see why we value Wally's advice so much. I should also tell you that just this week, Wally informed us that he feels so strongly about the future impact of FHE that he's willing to provide us with an endowed professorship to help us recruit an outstanding leader to launch a new initiative in this field. I'm so excited about this new initiative. I think it's really gonna to continue to place UF at the forefront of AI and cybersecurity. And I just wanna thank you again, Wally, for all of your support and your leadership. Thanks very much, Cammie. It's my pleasure. And I wanna thank all of you for attending and participating today. We will be hosting another webinar in this series in January. We'll be in touch with those details after the new year. It'll be hard to top this one, but I'm sure we'll have a great lineup. Thank you so much for joining us today and go Gators. Okay.